is a privilege to open your word, and we come before you needing the help and power of your Holy Spirit. But just as you promised, he would be given to lead us into all truth, so we count on that. So we call upon you and ask you for help. We pray for the liberty of the Spirit and pray for the release of your power to change our lives, even as we open your word, as we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you're interested in finding real joy and assurance of salvation and uh, power for living, stay tuned for the challenges from the Lord Jesus Christ in this passage and uh, as we look at the instruction from the vine and the branches. The result, as we're looking at in verse 11, is real joy. Beyond any joy that you can find in this world, because this is the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as we look at the outline today, it's three basic points. I just broke it down, the details of the metaphor in verses 1 through 3. The importance of abiding in verses 4 through 6, and the outcome of abiding in verses 7 through 11. Follow with me in God's word as I read from John chapter 15, 1 through 11. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. I had just received a call from a church uh, years ago that I was going to be coming to be their pastor. So I was in transition time. And as the time I was in transition, I was visiting people on the weekends we would come and there was a young couple that had, was very anxious to have Janet and me over on a Friday night to have dinner. And they said they had some questions about the Bible, so I thought this is going to be an exciting time. And so I went uh, just praying that God would bless us with a good evening and I went to their house. And they opened up to John chapter 15 and they said, we have some questions, Pastor, about this passage of scripture. And one of the scriptures they brought up was when it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And they said, Pastor, we've been asking God for a baby and we don't have a baby. We've been asking God for a new place to live and we don't have that. What's wrong here? I mean, uh, and then they went into this and said, you know, God wants us to be happy. Look at that last verse. And it says, there to them, it says, these things have I spoken to you that your joy, is, it, he, they were looking at their, their happiness is going to be fulfilled. So they were given a false gospel. They were led to Christ under a false pretense that Jesus was kind of like the genie in the lamp. They would just rub it a little bit, say a little couple words, and Jesus would pop up here, and they would just say, whatever you want. You have three wishes or whatever. You know, that's how they looked at it. It was a false gospel. They were led to Jesus Christ being their, just their genie to provide anything and everything they wanted. Okay, so... I said, well, first of all, there's a difference between joy and happiness. And then I said, well, let's just back up and let's just trace it down. And so I went through, and this took probably three hours that evening, of going through this whole scripture. This will not be a three-hour sermon. I know as soon as I said that, your, your eyes perked up and you said, I'll miss lunch. I won't have that. Well, I said, that was like three hours because they were, they were resistant to God's truth. But the more I've studied on this, and the more that I've seen through 30 plus years of ministry, is how God's people really resist with the truth that's in this passage of scripture. They resist it because they pretend it's not there. Because one of the things that is there is that you are expected to bear fruit. And if you're not bearing fruit, then there is no assurance of salvation. And if you're not bearing fruit and there's no assurance of salvation, there's opportunities to repent of that, which is a good news. 
But it also tells us very seriously, and what I want to look at today, is that if you are bearing fruit, God desires to see more fruit, yes, even much fruit. So there's kind of three levels. There's fruit, there's more fruit, and there's much fruit. So God desires to see that fruit in your life. And so let's just break it down and look at the first portion. And this is the details of the metaphor in verses 1 through 3 when he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. First of all, the vine, as I pointed out before our New Testament reading, the vine in the Old Testament was Israel. And so Jesus uses this and says, I am the true vine. The, the, I put on your, script, your uh, outline uh, Psalm uh, 80. It says, you brought out the, a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. That's the nation of Israel. God counted them as a vine from which all things would flow. And we find that in the book of Romans chapter 2. And Paul says, out of Israel came the doctrines and came the ordinances of God and came the history of God working in his people. This flowed out. It drew people to God in the Old Testament. So God's people were a vine, but as we read from Isaiah chapter, uh, chapter 5, the vine, rather than bringing forth fruit, brought forth fruit of wild grapes. It wasn't good. And he says that's because you've taken the word of God and you've turned and you've denied it. You've denied what it said and haven't followed the principles. And so what it became, they should have been a testimony of God's grace and goodness. Instead of that, they were following in sin and sin. And God said, you're bringing forth wild grapes. It says in Jeremiah that you, he says that, that Israel is a, he says, I have planted a choice vine, holy and pure. How then have you turned re degenerate and become a wild vine? And Hosea says, Israel is a, lux a luxuriant vine that, that yields its fruit. But as it increased, he says, they went to, toward other gods. Okay, so that is what we're looking at here. There's the vine, but it's not the vine of Israel. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Let me just chase this one just as I unpack this. Different things that said about Jesus being the true when it says that, John chapter 1, that Jesus came into the world and there was a light. That was John the Baptist. Remember, he was kind of reflected in the real light. And that's what he says, and the true light is Jesus Christ. In the book of uh, uh, John chapter 6, Jesus was talking about the manna from heaven. And he says, uh, and, but my father gives the true bread from heaven. Okay, he's the true light. He's the true bread. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about him being the true tabernacle. Okay, so... There's a trueness here. There's a true vine. And Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. So the purpose of the branch is to bring forth fruit. Let's back up for a second. Let me just grab a scripture from, he, uh, from Matthew chapter 13, when he gives the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils. And remember that he says he, he cast the seed, and some went on rocky ground, some uh, on ground that was pretty much not hard ground, and there was some on, on the ground that was like weeds, and then there was some on good ground. And the good ground brought forth fruit, it says, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. There again is fruit, there is more fruit, and there is much fruit. And so the whole parable of the soils is about being good ground to receive the word of God and respond with fruit in your life. So the question is, what does fruit look like? You know, we're to bear fruit. As a matter of fact, there's a sign where it says in Luke chapter 6 that it says a good tree brings forth good fruit, a bad tree brings forth bad fruit. Now, which kind of fruit are you bearing in your life? Okay, are we bringing forth good fruits? That's the question. Well, different parts of fruit. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you to study. Take a, a concordance or take your, what is it? Bible program, and you just search it out, and you say, fruit, and go through the New Testament, look at all the ways, and all, even in the Old Testament, all the ways that the Bible has about fruit. Give me, give you a, a few of them here, let me just chase this a little bit. First of all, in the book of Matthew chapter 3, there was a guy named John the Baptist, and he was preaching, and the religious leaders came out to him, because it was the popular thing to do, and he calls them, the, you brood of vipers, <laughs> you bunch of snakes, what are you coming out here for? And he told them, if you're going to come out and for, bring forth 
If you're going to come out and repent, bring fruits to repent. Fruit of repentance. In other words, don't talk the talk. Bring a life that changes. When God shows sin in our life, we need to change. We need to turn from that. When God shows us something, bring him forth fruit of repentance. As I mentioned, Nick likes to quote the old preacher to say that Christians are the best at repenting. We should be. That's the fruit. If we're not bringing fruit of repentance, there's something wrong in our lives. I know we had some people from a while that said, well, there's, I repented of my sins when I came to Jesus, and that's good enough. That's just like the old guy that said he told his wife that he loved her when they got married and said, if there's any change, I'll let you know. Okay, that is ridiculous to say that we don't sin. Matter of fact, John says in 1 John that if we say we have no sin, we lie, and we do not the truth. We aren't doing the truth if we say we have not sinned. May God give us grace to bring forth fruit of repentance on a daily, hourly, even so much that our sensitivity to sin is so much so the next time we're driving down the road and we want to curse at someone be cutting us off, we repent of that sin and turn from it. Or the times we think we carry on gossip or anything else, may we be so sensitive to sin. He's looking for fruit in our lives, the fruit of repentance. And secondly, and we find in Psalm 1, blessing the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and look what it says. And he will be like the, the tree that is planted by the streams of water, and it yields its fruit in its season. There's fruit from taking in the word of God. Jeremiah treats it the same way and says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who trust, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by waters and does not cease to bear fruit. And what is this fruit like? In Romans chapter 7, it says that we're to be dead to sin and to live to Christ in order that we may bear fruit for God. A righteous life is fruit to God. We're doing the right things. Ephesians chapter 5 says that at the time you were darkness, but now you light on the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and is right and is true. Is that what you hold to? Things that are good and right and true? Would you find your mind on television, newscasts, and other things that are taking away on the internet rather than what is right and true and light? Colossians says, so walk is a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him, bearing fruit in good, every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. But here's the fruit that we are looking for. The fruit of the Spirit is in the book of Galatians chapter 5 when it says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and, and gentleness and self-control and against such there is no law. God is looking for these character traits in our lives that rise to the top. And by the way, the way that he had developed that, we'll, we'll talk about in a moment, the way that he develops that is in situations that are totally contrary. The way that his love, that the fruit of the spirit of love is developed in your life is when you're in an unlovable situation. The way that the, the, that the spirit of God develops peace in your life is when you're in an unpeaceful situation. And the way that the Holy Spirit dealt, dwells, brings out joy in your life when there seems to be no joy. That's when it shines up and says, I didn't produce that. And again, this fruit is not something we go, I'm going to produce this fruit. We can't. We cooperate with the moving of the Spirit of God to bring it out. And it's His doing in our lives, like the repentance or good works. But it is God who does it. In Philippians chapter 4, by the way, it's a fruit of giving of ourselves and giving of our, our money. That's fruit in our lives. In Hebrews chapter 12, we bring out the uh, peaceable fruit of righteousness. In Hebrews 13, the fruit of our lips, even the giving of thanks. When you're singing praise to God on Sunday morning, you are bringing forth fruit. Okay. In Romans chapter 1, it says that we even bring others. Paul said that I may bring a harvest or a fruit among you, which means that when we draw others to Jesus Christ, we're bringing forth fruit. So fruit, character traits, repentance, good works, the fruit of our lips and giving thanks. God is looking for fruit in our life. Now, the work of the vine dresser is threefold. The work of the vine dresser is found in verses 1, 
B, uh, it says, my father's the vine dresser. And then verse 2 says, every branch that mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bring forth more fruit. First of all, I say the vine dresser has this responsibility. The vine dresser has the responsibility of providing everything that is needed for the vine to bring forth fruit. And he has done that. I put on your outline 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Listen to these words. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness uh, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he granted to us his precious and great promises so that through them you become partic- uh, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now that's pretty cool. God has given us everything that we need in, his, in life and godliness to be bearing fruit to his glory. I say, so a person can't say, well, I can't bear fruit because I don't have anything. Yes, you do. He's given everything that you need, including his exceedingly great and precious promises. And isn't it sad when you ask somebody about the promises of God, can you give me a promise from God? Well, I don't know. Or what is your, famous, what is your, your best, your favorite promise? I don't know. Friends, that's God's checkbook. And he says, go ahead and write a blank check. It's, it's there for you. Claim it. Okay? One of my favorite promises. We had this done by one of my professors uh, in, in seminary. His wife did a little, we call that calligraphy or something. I don't know when she made a little. Jeremiah 33 3. Remember old JR here he used to say, that's God's telephone number. <laughs> okay, Jeremiah 33 3 says, call unto me. God says this. And by the way, I've been studying the book of Jeremiah. What a precious. What a precious scene. God is telling Jeremiah to tell the people, you're going to be taken into captivity. You may as well go peacefully. Okay? You may as well, and then he tells them, by the way, Jeremiah, I want you to buy this piece of property because people are going to come back. Your descendants are going to claim this property. So you, you buy this property. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is surrounding the, the city. Right? They're about to be taken. Right? And, and so go buy this property, Jeremiah. Huh? Okay, in the midst of this, Jeremiah is quoting from God and says, Thus says the Lord, Call unto me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which you know not. I don't know how many times Jan and I have claimed that promise in our lives. That is an encouragement of promise. Call to me, and I will answer you. Jeremiah 33, 3. You go through the New Testament, the Old Testament. Come on now. Everybody knows some promises. But notice what he says. He's given us exceedingly great and precious promises. I love that. Everything that we need for life and godliness, he has presented to us. And then he says, follows it up and says, Therefore, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and knowledge temperance, temperance, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, charity. And he says, if these qualities be in you, you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of God. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he's purged from his old sins. Wait a minute. Because he says, make your call an election sure. Stop the music. God has provided everything we need. Yeah, and he says, take advantage of it. Because if you're not, you're cutting yourself off. Hmm. So let's go on here. Because the next thing Jesus brings up, every branch that does not bear fruit, he cuts off. I'm sure that the disciples were really in a quandary of how to feel about Judas Iscariot. He walked with them for three years. He was their treasurer. He was part of them. He saw everything that they saw, experienced everything that they experienced. And I believe this is one of the reasons why John, in writing the Gospel of John, every time he mentions Judas Iscariot, says, the one that betrayed Jesus. I believe it's kind of like saying, we didn't even recognize this bum. How could we have, we we didn't even realize who he was and what he was doing. He betrayed Jesus. And so I believe that part of this is giving some, some exercise to the minds of the disciples to sort things out here. Because here is one that walked with them, but he's no longer there. And as John writes this gospel later in the century after Judas is long gone, I believe that is some of the things that made an impact on Judas as well, or on, on, on John as well as the other disciples. 
Christians. How do we feel about this, a person that does not bear fruit? This is a time to wake up, friends. This is the flashing lights here. Because the question is, are, is your life bearing fruit? Is it really bearing fruit? Because it says here that if it doesn't bear fruit, God's going to cut it off. That's it. Now, there's a, different ways to cut it off. And some say, well, this is a person that is an actual apostate. They really never had life to begin with. That could be. Because we know that in the church, there's always apostates. There are people that are going to be with us, and then they're not going to be with us, and they really never were from us. They never were with us, John says in 1 John chapter 2. We understand that. But there is a sense when God's children deny the very, and cut themselves off from the flow of life in the church and the Lord Jesus Christ, and they dry up and wither. And I believe what they have is they, instead of looking to God as their father and enjoying fellowship, they look to him as an angry God that's out to get them. You ever talk to somebody like that? Oh, I just think God's out to get me. Hmm. Why? Because they cut themselves off from fellowship with God. Now, whether they really weren't a child, we don't know, and we don't have access to the Lamb's Book of Life, so all we can tell is fruit, and that's why Jesus says, by their fruits you're known. Now, let me give you a parable that Jesus spoke when we, when we deal with this. Because one of the things we don't want, to, don't want you to think is God is standing there with a rifle. Okay? And you make one false move, he's going to let you have it. Alright? The parable that, that I'm going to get to is in, in Luke chapter 13. We told the parable about a fig tree that's planted in a vineyard. And, he came, and, he, and the, vineyard, the owner came and looking for fruit on him and found none. He said to the vine dresser, cut this off. Cut it down. Get it out of here. It's dead weight. And the vine dresser says, well, let me, let me work it up the ground. And as you said here, let me dig around and put some manure on it. <laughs> okay? Never thought I would say manure from the pulpit, but I just read the scripture. Okay, so. All right, now. Here we go. And he says, it, and, then let it, let, and then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, I'll cut it down. What's he telling us there? God is merciful. We should never presume upon his mercy. We should never go out sinning and say, well, I can just come back and just, you know, confess it and God will be merciful to me. No, we don't want to do that. But let's understand that God is a merciful God. Why? You know why? Because next time you're going down US 19 and you just had in your mind to flip somebody off because they cut you off, okay, just, yeah, that's enough to send you to hell. Do you understand that? With our words and our minds and our thoughts, everything is... A, is an action that, that could send us to hell because it's, a, it's an affront against the eternal, holy God. But God has had mercy on us that we're not immediately cast into hell. That's mercy. Now, but what we want to get to is Jesus said, take, take care how you hear. The one who has will be given more. The one who has not, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. That's the case of many people. They're just cut off. And they don't know their right hand from the left. Whether they're, they were never children of God, I don't know. But I know that they're in, misery. they're in misery in this life. That's why Paul says in Timothy, 2 Timothy, he says, pray that as you deal with people, that God perhaps will grant them repentance, leading them to knowledge of the truth, and they come to their senses, may escape the snare that the devil that is captured by, to do his will. The point is, because they don't abide in the vine, as we'll see here, Another verse down says, anyone that does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch. Just thrown away and dried up. Okay? Understand, the ups and, there are ups and downs of Christians. But I'm talking about a lack of fruit bearing. Consistent fruit bearing. I mean, we have some times when we're dark and you know, we go through times of dryness. I'm talking about some consistency here. If a person does not have fruit in their life, there's a reason for concern. And, that concern is genuine because that concern should lead to repentance. And if there's repentance, there's hope. But if there's no repentance and there's no concern, that's dangerous. So we need to pray as we deal with people that God would give them repentance from their state. Well, I want you to look, notice the other part of this. This explains why you have suffering in life. I'm not 
trying to belittle the suffering that you have. Physical, relational, financially, every other kind of suffering. I'm not belittling that. I'm just saying, here's the answer. Okay? Here's the answer. In the book of Hebrews, as we read from Hebrews 12, verses 3 through 11, notice the words in verse 5. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Do you, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son whom he receives. This is where he says in John 15, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bring forth more fruit. So even if you have a little fruit in your life, God's not satisfied. He wants you to bring forth more fruit. Why? Because more fruit is more joy for you and more glory to him. Period. Sounds good? Let's follow it then. That's why in verse 8, he says, If you are left without discipline, which all participate, then your illegitimate children are not sons. Isn't it interesting? That's where we want to go. That's what we want in life. We want our lives to be so comfortable, never disrupted at all. And yet, if that, had, if that were the case in life, then we have no evidence of salvation at all. We have no assurance of salvation. But, because you have afflictions and persecutions and sufferings and disappointments in life, here's a word I want you to think about. Superfluous. Superfluous. Begins in Hebrews chapter 12, and he says this. He says, uh, Seeing that we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. In other words, we carry a lot of baggage around in life. I love riding bicycles, and I, I was listening to the podcast on the Velo News this past week about all the ways you could lighten your bike. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You know, you go carbon fiber this, carbon fiber that. And pretty soon, you, you know, they have, a, they have a specific weight that they're like the guys in the Tour de France. They have to add weight to their bikes because the bike manufacturers can make it so light that what would happen is when they're going downhill, they would just take off. <laughs> they would fly. Okay? So you have, to, you have to have so much weight on here. I think it's 6.8 grams, something like that. Anyway, not very much. Okay? The problem is, as we're going through life, we just take on other, other stuff. We get worldly ways. We get evil thoughts, unforgiving thoughts. And pretty soon, we're just car we're carrying around a lot of baggage. No wonder God's children, how are you doing? I'm all right under the circumstances. And the old pe preacher said, well, what are you doing under there? <laughs> and the circumstances are the baggage we carry around in life. There's a lot of superfluous stuff that we have, thinking, actions, that is actually hindering us from bringing forth more fruit. And so the only way to get rid of that is God has to strike the blow, allow circum circumstances in our lives that kind of shake us up, put us on our back, or whatever it is, to say, you need me more than that stuff. You need to hold on to me. I'm the only way that you're going to produce fruit. Instead of being satisfied with, eh, a little dab will do you, that'll be enough. No. God says, here's what's going on. Remember in Romans chapter, by the way, verse 11 in Hebrews chapter 12 says, For the moment, all discipline seems to be painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Romans 8 says, after he says, all, we know that all things work together for good, says those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God is doing that in your life. If you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, and you have declared your faith in, in Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation, God is not going to leave you stay there. God is going to grow you to become more and more in your character to be like Jesus Christ. And one of the ways is he's going to look at all the superfluous stuff that's in your life and give you grace to at least that stuff and hold on to him. 2005, that happened to me. God gave me the grace. I, mean, I believe that during the midst of a, a very trying circumstances, God, in his grace, and God had blessed me. I don't know why, but, it, you know, that I was now doing Iron Man. I was sponsored by Spam, and I was the Spam Man. Okay? Silly stuff. But God gave me grace in that. I mean, we made 
multiple trips to Hawaii on spam. Wonderful. I was holding too tight to it. There was a lot of superfluous stuff. So God took away my health. I remember coming home from the doctor and hearing these words. I don't know what to do for you, Bob. I'm going to send you to National Jewish Medical Center in Denver, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, my oxygen saturation level was going lower and lower and lower until it was, it, it was, I was detrimental. I was in very bad condition. He wanted to put me on oxygen. I said, no, that's like the death blow. I don't want to be on oxygen. So I go to National Jewish Medical Center in Denver, and that's the first thing they did, put me on oxygen, because it's a city that's on high altitude, right? And the oxygen level is lower anyway. I just saw my health decrease and decrease and decrease to the point where I was even went through the one breath from death experience when they pulled my chest tube too soon, my lung collapsed. It's interesting. What was important while we were in the hospital? Jan and I were given the spirit of gratitude where we thank God for everything that came into our lives. And because of that, we had opportunities to minister. What is the most important thing in life? God has called me to minister, not to be the spam man. That was a, that was a, great, a great gig, but it was temporary. And it was so easy to latch on to. God is doing that in your life, too. David says... Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Here's the point. God is purging us, pruning us of those things that take away from good fruit so that we bring forth more fruit. Okay, and how does he do that? He purges us with the circumstances that kind of shake us up, and then he brings in the Word of God, and that's make, what makes us clean. When Jesus says, now you're clean through the Word. He cleans us up. Even the places that He injured, He cleans it up through the Word of God. The Word of God is sharp, quick, and it's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Even so, dividing asunder of thought and intents of the heart. Wow! He goes to the fine points. Not only that, but He says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof. Cuts in. Preach the word, he tells preachers. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Makes that cut. He's cutting things out that are superfluous. So what's in your life that's superfluous? It takes you away from serving God and bringing forth fruit to his glory. Now, the importance of abiding in verses 4 through 6. Notice he says, isn't this a beautiful way? He says, abide in me and I in you. Okay, we're together in this. Abide in me and I in you. Well, how does he get in us? Well, we understand. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and my Father will come. We'll make our abode with you. He abides in us. And as we covered in John 14, not only he, but the Holy Spirit, he would send the Comforter, he comes to us, and the He and the Father comes to us. The Trinity lives within us. Wow. Yes. What a good thing. Abide in me. He's there. We can two walk together except they be agreed. We don't enjoy him because we're not in agreement with him. We're doing things on our own, following our own agenda. And so I put on the second point, there's a difference between the dependent and the independent branches. He says, abide in me, you bring forth much fruit. Notice abide three times in verse 4. It brought out in 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, and 16. Abide, abide, abide. What happens if we don't abide? We dry up. I thought, what's a good illustration of drying up? The churches at Ephesus, seven churches. There's only one that didn't dry up. That was the church in Philadelphia, and they were under much persecution. Interesting. They were under much persecution, and so what they were doing, calling on the Lord, right? Now, the church at Ephesus, they left their first love. They were going through the motions. Just They left their first love. The church at Smyrna were putting up with false teaching. Likewise, the church at Thyatira. The church at Sardis had a reputation of being alive, but Jesus says, you're dead. You don't show any life at all. And then the church at Laodicea. Thought they were rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing. Isn't that interesting? He says, you're lukewarm. I'll spit you out of my mouth. Wow. See, that dried up state 
moves us from fellowship and intimacy to a dried up state. If you're in a dried up state today, I call on you to repent. Ask God to give you life. Ask God to burden you about those things that are superfluous in your life that he's been dealing with and poking at and you're refusing to listen to him. Come back and enjoy his fellowship. Abiding is the only way to bear fruit because Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. So in other words, fruit bearing does not mean you go, I'm going to bear fruit today. No, no, no. You apply the effort to be close to him. He produces fruit in your life. Now, how does that happen? How does that look? Abiding in Him. That's the third point, the outcome of abiding. First of all, there's a closeness to Christ. This closeness to Christ, where he says in verse 7, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, we'll ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Closeness to Christ. Now, where would that find? Let's see. Do you have a tendency to stay away from the church meetings or be part of them? You know, I knew realize that there's a, Million and one excuses why you can't be here on Wednesday night. You know, we've, we're talking about maybe starting a Sunday evening service. And there's a million and one excuses why you weren't there. And I don't say we go around saying, label people, oh, they're, 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 they're not. But I'm saying this. Jesus here has promised in Matthew chapter 18, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. So, if you're neglecting Wednesday night, you're missing out on the presence of Jesus, abiding with him. If you're missing out on our Sunday morning service or our Bible study, you're missing out on abiding with him. I'm saying we need to be a little more um, envious, a little more coveting of his presence. And one of the presence is when my people are gathered together in my name, I'm here. Believe that? That's his promise. Secondly, his word. Does his word have a place in your life on a daily basis? If not, why not? Stress this. We stress this. But Jesus says here, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. People are satisfied with just reading a devotional about the word. People are satisfied with a little thought of the day without the word. I'm saying you need the word of God. This is God speaking. Because Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words Abide in you. And then it comes to this prayer. Ask whatever you wish and it'll be done to you. All right. Is he opening the genie bottle and saying, what is your three wish? No. John chapter 5, 1 John 5 says, well, this is the confidence that we have toward him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We know that he hears us, whatever we ask. We know we have what we request when we asked of him. James chapter 4 says, you have not because you ask not and because you ask amiss to consume it on your own lust. In other words, if you're praying for a new Mercedes today, okay, that's your own lust. Matter of fact, if you're asking for the, the bucks plate today, I don't even know. Okay. When we get at, we ask for a lot of dumb stuff. Okay. When you ask according to his will, you need to know his will, don't you? There's only one way to know his will, and that is abiding in Christ and his words abiding in you. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we destroy all arguments and bring every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take into captivity every thought to obey Christ. We bring that into his, his submission. In Romans chapter 12, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or test and discern what is the will of God. The point is, the more that you're abiding with him in fellowship with other people, the more that you're abiding in him in his word on a daily basis, the more that your prayer life will be consumed with his will. You'll be praying according to his will. You'll have confidence that he hears you. And if you have confidence that he hears you, you have those things. Okay, the church met and prayed that Catalina would have a good birth. Okay, the other night, we're sitting at the bed and course, looking at baby Grace, just amazed at this wonderful life. But here's the thing that just struck me. When Catalina talked about, I don't think birth is, given, is easy, but it was much easier than anticipated. How's that? Is that? Okay. It was much easier than anticipated. Why? That was an answer to prayer. 
How does that make you feel when you've prayed for something and God has answered it? God, the sovereign of the universe, put it on your mind and to think about His will and you prayed according to His will. You saw the answer and you said, Whoa! What a gracious God allowed me to participate in His sovereign actions. But if all you're doing is like this couple that I was talking to years ago, gimme this, gimme that, gimme, 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 you think that's according to his will? Absolutely not. Does he, just, does he want to teach you to be a selfish little brat focused on yourself? Absolutely not. He wants to teach you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Let me just hit the last part, verses 11, 8 through 11. God is glorified when we bear fruit. Fruit is produced. Discipleship, he says in verse 8, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Prove. Prove to whom? Well, first of all, to you. That's assurance of salvation. And that's why he says, just as you do my commandments, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I keep my Father's commandments and abide in his love. One thing I want you to notice before we go, because the time's gone, but just notice this. The true and lasting joy. These things have I spoken to you that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. Notice it's not joy that's thought up, brought up, his joy in us. Isn't that interesting? In John chapter 14, he says, my peace I give to you. His peace, his joy in us because he's in us. And we're abiding with him. And it overflows with peace and joy. So we come to Nehemiah when it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. May God help us to be fruit-bearing. As our brethren come to prepare the table before us, we come to enjoy that blessing of being fruit-bearing and keeping his commandments, just as his Father has given us commandments and we fulfill his promises.